So I'm going to be talking about rock gardening in the South and how you can do it. Now, our organization is a rock garden society, and maybe we've taken too much for granted on how you rock garden in the South, but I put together this talk uh, some years ago, and I give it often to garden clubs. I don't often give it to a rock garden society, since you all are purists and you know what rock gardening is. But at the last minute, I didn't have any other uh, uh, talks to give, so uh, it's too late to call anybody at midnight last night, although some people were, were rummaging through their slides thinking about the possibility. But anyway, so I'll be talking about how you can rock garden in the South. Let me start here. Is that in focus? Yeah. Okay. Um, in 1990, Elizabeth March wrote this. She wrote, the cultivation of rock plants is the highest form of the art of gardening. Gardening is an art, and the rock garden is its purest form. All gardeners become rock gardeners if they garden long enough. So I think she's throwing down the gauntlet and making a charge to all of you if you continue to garden, you're going to be a rock garden sooner or later. Now, she wrote that in this book, uh, published in 1990 by Duke University Press. She had, died, uh, she had died in 1985, and apparently this manuscript was actually written in the 1940s. And she tried to sell the book about rock gardening in the Southeast, uh, apparently to UNC Press and maybe to uh, publishers in New York, also Duke University Press. But no one had an interest in that, thinking it was too early to rock her in the southeast. And so it was only after she died that the remnants of the manuscript were found uh, by Duke University editors. And Nancy Goodwin and Alan Lacey um, helped put the book together and published it in 1990 under the title, A Rock Garden in the South. So this is a sort of roadmap of what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, definition, history of rock gardening. Uh, some public rock gardens, uh, three ways that you can rock garden here in the southeast, uh, some recommended plants, and then some outstanding rock gardens that I have seen in my travels around the world. First of all, what is a rock garden plant? Well, first of all, I'll tell you it's a subjective term. But a rule of thumb is it's a dwarf plant or a diminutive plant, a one that grows slowly. <coughs> Uh, the rule of thumb is it's a plant more or less around 12 inches tall. Now, we all can bend that rule, and we do. But the other uh, rule of thumb is it should look good. The plant should look good in a rocky setting. In other words, it should look good as if it were in a rocky, naturalistic setting. And it should be in scale with the other plants and the rocks in the surrounding area. A couple of definitions. Uh, you're here when... When you talk to rock gardeners, you'll hear the term alpine. Now, alpine is a special kind of rock garden plant. And it's a, it's a rock garden plant that grows above the timber line. The timber line is the area uh, above which uh, trees no longer grow. But it's also the area below permanent snowfall, <coughs> where the uh, permanent snow, uh, snow cover. And it comes from the word alps. Maybe that's obvious, but many people don't realize that. It simply comes from the word alps, meaning alpine. Now, where do you find rock garden plants? Well, just about <coughs> anywhere plants will grow, you can find a suitable rock garden plant that you can adapt and grow in your garden here in the southeast. They grow in all kinds of habitats, sunny, shade, wet, dry, you name it, a rock garden plant uh, can be grown there. Uh, but here in the southeast, we have some problems, and rock garden plants that you try to grow here in the southeast requires special attention. And some of the special rules that you have to follow include these. They need to have quick draining soil, a soil where the water will run through fairly quickly, but also just enough retentiveness in the soil so that some moisture is retained so that the plants will grow and live. They also should be thin soil, meaning not a lot of organic material. Uh, and also, uh, they should generally have a cool space where the roots can grow. These are just, just general things about growing rock garden plants in the southeast. And here are the problems. Uh, we have wet and hot summers. We get most of our rainfall here in the southeast, or in North Carolina, in the July to September time frame, from tropical storms, hurricanes, afternoon thunderstorms. <coughs> it's also the time we have high humidity, uh, we have nighttime temperatures sometimes at 
don't get below 70 or 80 degrees at night. And what this means is the plants that, metab that made chlorophyll in the daytime metabolize at night uh, and burn up the energy that they produce during the daytime. Now, during these hot summer nights and high temperatures, you also can have soil-borne uh, pathogens, bacteria, fungus, mold, which also can be a problem. Uh, J.C. Ralston used to say that if you can grow a plant uh, in the month of August, it will grow the other 11 months of the year. If it runs <laughs> and the other problem is clay soil. Here in the Piedmont area, we have clay soil that can give it drainage. So you have to amend the soil in a way that you get the, <coughs> just the right kind of drainage that you need in order to successfully grow a rock garden plant. Now, this is a photograph taken in 1870 of the first example of the first known exhibit of rock garden plants in the West, and that was at the Edinburgh Botanic Garden in 1870. And what you see here in this photograph is a collection of plants in containers, in troughs, pots, also on benches and shelves, uh, all being grown in a display area uh, for the first time. And this was very, very popular in 1870 uh, in Scotland and other parts of England, in other parts of the United Kingdom as well. But this is the first way that people thought they could grow rock garden plants was in containers. Many of these plants came from Europe, the continental Europe, and were uh, put in pots and grown and displayed uh, at, these ex at this exhibition. Now, this is the same area uh, some 80 years later in 1950, the Edinburgh Botanic Garden. But this is an old black and white <coughs> photograph that's been hand tinted or hand painted to make it look like it's color. But the big difference between this slide and the previous one is that the plants are now planted in the ground or in the soil. So it tends to mimic or look like a naturalistic setting that these plants would probably grow in if you were in the Alps, for example, in Europe. Now the oldest uh, continuous botanical garden, uh, rock garden in the United States is at Smith College. And that was established in 1897 in Northampton, Massachusetts. And that garden was put there to help teach the principles of botany to the young women who were learning botany and science there at Smith College in 1897. And that garden has been there, it's been renovated several times over the years. This is a photograph I took about 10 years ago when I was there in the autumn. This is about a third of it. But you can see that it has, they have put the labels there and they've organized it uh, sort of a group it by plant family. So it's a, sort of an artificial group of plants, not as they would grow in nature, but as they would be organized botanically by plant family. Uh, one of the people who promoted rock gardening here in North Carolina was William O'Neill Hunt, Bill Hunt. Uh, he died in 1996. But in 1935, he was appointed the regional vice president of the uh, then American Rock Garden Society. They had regional vice president in those days. And uh, he demonstrated rock gardening in Chapel Hill in 1935 by bringing in 100-pound blocks of ice into the basement of one of the churches in Chapel Hill and covering the blocks of ice with burlap and sphagnum moss. And then he dug some native plants around Chapel Hill and put them into a display there to, quote, demonstrate uh, rock gardening in the southeast and how you could do it. Now, this was before air conditioning. So it was in July, so people flocked into the basement of the church there in Chapel Hill to see rock gardening coming to the southeast. Now another old rock garden in this area was one that Nancy Goodwin and uh, Crawford Goodwin found when they moved to uh, Montrose there in Hillsboro and began to uncover the brambles and things that had grown there for a number of years. And this is some of the, the uh, old original rock that was put there by the previous owner apparently I think about 1920s or 30s or so. But that is, uh, was apparently a rock garden uh, that was there, and she uncovered some old bulbs that had been planted there years before it began to come back. And the Arboretum here at NC State actually had a, a, a small rock garden in 1984. I don't know if any of you remember that or not, but this is a, one of the photographs, a, a photograph of part of it there. Uh, an attempt to show rock gardening. We've gone a long way since then, but that's one of the early uh, attempts by JC and uh, students and staff to develop a rock garden here at NC State. 
<coughs> the finest rock garden in the southeast is a public rock garden. It's the one in Atlanta. This is the Atlanta Botanical Garden. This is a garden that's facing to the southeast. And it's about, uh, I think, about 25 feet, uh, uh, I'm sorry, about 50 feet wide and about 15 or 20 feet uh, wide. And what they've done is they've taken some native stone and put it into the ground. Uh, most of it is buried into the ground. The tips of it peek out, as you see there, peep out. And so you can see that it attempts to look like a natural rock garden, as you might find around Atlanta in that area. But it's a beautiful rock garden. This is a, a springtime photograph uh, that was taken about uh, six or eight years ago. Now, the finest rock garden, in my opinion, in the United States is the one in Denver. It's the Denver Botanical Gardens. Uh, that area gets only about 12 inches of rain per year. <coughs> it's a mile high, yet it's able to grow successfully a wide range of rock garden type plants. And this is a photograph uh, taken uh, in, the mid in mid summer. And this is a photograph of a similar area there at Denver taken in the springtime. Uh, Panioda colitis of the Denver Botanic Garden. He's spoken here in the past. Some of you may know him. Uh, but he has promoted a lot of plants from the Intermountain West uh, in the states that are surround uh, Colorado uh, that, particular, that will particularly grow very well there in that area. And you remember Mike Kinchin who was here uh, a couple of years ago and spoke to our chapter. He is now the head of the, 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 gar the rock garden there. <clears throat> This is a fine rock garden that I saw in Prague in the Czech Republic. This is called St. John on the Rock. I love the name of that church because I think it's appropriate for a rock garden. But it's a rock garden that's managed by the Prague Rock Garden Club. The church in the background there was, uh, has, has been several types of church. I think it was Catholic at one time. It was Lutheran church. It's not now being used. But during Soviet, uh, the Soviet era, uh, the Czech Rock Garden Club acquired lease to that property. I think they have like a, a 30 or 40 year lease and they have put in a rock garden at that church and every spring they have their spring sale where they allow the public to come in and uh, buy plants and also see rock garden plants at that rock garden there in Prague. Uh, this is a rock garden at the Royal Botanic Garden in Kew in London and these are large blocks of sandstone and other other native stone there outside of London that have been brought in and plantings of rock garden plants put around it. Now this rock garden is designed in a way such that you can, it, the pathway is, is lower than uh, the, the garden itself so you can actually see the plants at eye level. And this is the Alpine House at Kew Gardens which was built uh, about 10 years ago I believe in London. And inside the Alpine House, this is a, a section of the Alpine House garden. But what you can't see is that underneath are refrigeration coils that actually cool the soil because many of these rock garden plants <coughs> need cool, uh, cool environment to grow in, because, especially those in the back there, because they normally grow maybe 10,000, 12,000 foot elevation. So they are actually creating a artificial environment by cooling the soil for the plants to grow. This is the rock garden in, at Wisley in Surrey, <coughs> south of London. Not unlike the one at Kew, but the difference here is that instead of the uh, plants being at eye level, the rocks are about you know, knee high, so you, you have to look down to see them. Now, I want to describe to you three ways that you can grow rock garden plants here in the southeast, notwithstanding the problems I described earlier, the heat and the humidity and the fungus and the mold and the clay soils. <laughs> uh, but there are three ways that you can grow them successfully, and I'm going to show you examples of people doing that. Using raised beds and walls, berms, or troughs. I'll start out with a raised bed. Now this is a raised bed in uh, Maryland that John Ray designed. And this is a very simple raised bed. And what he's got here, he's got four by four pieces of timber where he has put rock garden plants in. He's put in sand and uh, gravel to create drainage, and he's put these plants there. But what he's basically done, he's lifted the garden up, uh, what is that, four, four or five inches from the ground level, <coughs> so there's area for the water to drain through and drain out. 
Now the next photograph has taken this same idea and extended it up to about knee high, knee or waist high. The same kind of uh, pieces of timber, but it's been raised up, so it's almost at eye level. Well, not at eye level, but at least waist level, so you can garden more easily that way. This is a garden uh, on the Hudson River in uh, New York. Uh, Midge Riggs' garden. Now, Midge has also taken the idea a step further for a raised bed, and what she's done, she's taken fallen logs and, and uh, fallen uh, branches and filled them in with the material and planted them inside. Now, this kind of material won't last very long, it'll rot away, but it's a very cheap way to, cre to create a raised bed. And this could be done here in North Carolina. But the idea of the raised bed is you're creating a drainage area, a drainage space, so that the water can run away, run away from the plant and not puddle there because of uh, humidity problems and uh, fungus and mold. This is one Ron McBeach's garden in Scotland, the very same idea, where he's taken some old logs uh, and tree trunks and put them together into a raised bed to grow uh, alpine plants there in Scotland. And another example of Ron's garden in Scotland, this is uh, using stone to create a raised bed, and that's the North Sea there in the background with wind blowing constantly on, on, the, on this plant. And this is one we saw when we went to Charlotte, USC Charlotte, on a uh, rock garden tour, spring tour a few years ago at the Botanical Garden there. And what you're seeing here is a sort of a stair step uh, raised bed. Here on the left are maybe a few inches of raised bed. It goes up a little higher, maybe eight to 10 inches, and then even higher to about, to up to about a foot and a half. But all these are examples of raised beds. This is another raised bed uh, at Wisley in Surrey, and that's the, that's the raised bed there, you see. It's old, old sandstone, I think, from around uh, south of London that they created, and that's about the waist high. And in it, they filled it in, put in uh, various rock garden plants. And in addition to the raised beds, if also there are crevices, oops, back up. There are crevices in the wall here that you can put in little plants here too. So when I say raised beds, I'm also meaning <coughs> raised beds and walls because they, they uh, can be thought of together because you can tuck little plants in these holes here. Now, probably the finest rock gardener in North Carolina is Ed Whitmore. Uh, that's her late husband, Bruce, who lived uh, uh, at Penrose near Brevard, North Carolina. And she's also taken the idea of a um, raised bed here, on, here in the foreground and the background. And what she has here, almost all of these plants are plants from the American West, so they require very little rainfall. But she lives in an area that gets about twice as much rain as we do here in, in Raleigh. We get about 45 or 50 inches of rain per year. She, she gets about 80 or 90 inches of rain per year because the storms coming out of the Gulf of Mexico hit those mountains there near Brevard and dump a lot of water. So she has to oops, so she has to provide cover during rainy days or for excessive rain to cover the plant, even though she's got drainage so they won't be drowned. The same thing here, she can put a plastic cover over the plants here in the front. See most of these are conifers that she's got in the foreground. <coughs> and this is Frank Cabot's garden at Cold Spring uh, called Stone Crop. These are, this is an expensive raised bed or rock, uh, rock hard wall because this is all granite that's been filled in here. This is about chest high. And he has tucked in plants in the wall here. So what we've done is with a, a raised bed or a wall, it's lifting up the gardening area above the, the ground area to provide drainage. And all these are examples of that. This is a new one that was installed at the U.S. Botanic Garden in Washington across the street from the Capitol building a few years ago. And uh, they had not, when I took this photograph, they had not put in um, uh, plants in the crevices yet, but they will be doing that later, I think. And this is one I did a long time ago, a raised bed. Uh, it's on sloping, a piece of sloping land at home. 
uh, here on the left hand side, it's only about four or five inches, and as you go down, it slopes down to the right hand side, it's about knee high or waist high. Mm -hmm. So, I've talked about a raised bed. So, what do you put in a raised bed to make it work for us here in the Southeast? Well, generally, you put in a mixture of one third topsoil, the native soil that you have wherever you garden, one third leaf bowl or human, something organic, and then one third of something that will give you drainage. And that something can be uh, small pea gravel or sand or permatil. Permatil is commercial uh, uh, product. It's, um, it's permatil is fired slate. It's slate that's been uh, uh, burned at like I think a thousand or two thousand degrees Fahrenheit and it expands into this very, very lightweight. It's about the size of a garden pea. It's got a rough edge to it, but it's very, very lightweight and porous. And if you put any of those, either permatil or pea gravel or sand, into that mixture will give you the porosity that you need for the water to drain mm -hmm. through. <clears throat> now a berm, that's the second way to rock garden. Now a berm is really a raised bed without a wall. Think of it that way. It's a raised bed without any wall, walls on either side of it. Now this is the garden uh, berm of Normanville, Lake Normanville in Raleigh. And some people say that a, a berm like this looks like an elephant graveyard or something of that kind. <laughs> but, what, but the thing about a berm is that it gives you, based on the geometry of a berm, it gives you more planting surface, more planting area than you would if you had a straight wall. If you think about the mathematics of it, a, a, a raised bed has just a flat surface on the top, but a berm has those sides as well too. So that's Norman Bill's garden, in a uh, former garden in Raleigh. The finest example of that, I think, is uh, Graham Ray's garden in Greensboro. Uh, that's a very pleasing one to look at. It's very pleasant to the eye. It's a mixture of conifers. It's a midsummer photograph with hostas in it and uh, other rock garden plants. On the right-hand side, just out of the picture, is a swimming pool. Uh, and, uh, and of course, it's behind his house there in his patio. But it's very beautiful and a very good example. And of course, he has put in, uh, I think, Staylight is another name for Permatil, another trade name for Permatil. So he's got a lot of, uh, of that there to create the porosity that he needs for the drainage to take place. This is another one at the U.S. Botanic Garden in Washington, another berm. And this is, I believe, has calcite um, from the Western United States in it. And most of these plants are Western United States plants. It just been put in when I took the photograph. But again, it's a berm because it has no walls to it, and it creates a large surface area for you to plant in. Uh, the rock garden just outside the building here is a, really a berm. We call it a street garden, but if you think about it and look at it, it's got the geometry of a berm on both sides here. This is a photograph taken, I think, the first year after Tim and others planted it, so it's fairly new. <coughs> the rooftop is another example of a berm here at the Arboretum. And really, the finest example of a berm is the one that Tony Abbott has at Plant Lunch Nursery at Juniper Level. And I think uh, he has 250 foot long berms. Oops, let me back up. Here, kind of wind around on either side and see that they are cold. But again, the importance of berm is that it gives you the drainage that you need, but it gives you more planting space on a, a raised bed would give you. Bobby, the purpose of the big rocks and something like that, are they, is it just Aesthetic. I think so, yeah. But it also, uh, I think Tony told me when I was visiting one time that he put some rocks in like that in order to be able to step with his foot to be able to get to a plant to weed or mm -hmm. to do what it needs to. Because it, you, can't, you can't stand in the middle of this, uh, uh, these two berms here and reach all the way over to the other side or to the middle. You have to have a, a stepping area, a stepping stone, I guess. There's a photograph taken from the belly. And I think he's stretching the rules of a 12, 12 inch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but doesn't Tony do that all the time? It's 
Yeah, it's in scale, right? And another photograph <coughs> at the end of at the end of one of the burns, how it how it, it, it it's rounded off, <coughs> and a close up of some of the plants in the burn, <coughs> lupin and iris and other plants. Now, the composition of a burn is really the same as the composition of a raised bed: one third, one third, one third. One third soil, your native soil. One third mold or humus, and then one third pea gravel, sand, or permafrost. And troughs, that's the third way to rot garden here in the southeast. Now this is a collection of troughs uh, Ed Whitmore has in Brevard. They're not necessarily pretty, and she would be the first to admit that, but they are functional. They do grow rock garden plants, the kind that she likes to grow. Everything from carnivorous plants, these are picture plants here, to conifers, and many, many other kind of plants. Uh, and she uh, paints many of them black. Uh, some of them have holes in the bottom so that plants can actually grow into the soil if they need to. But that's one example of uh, troughs. This is another example of troughs. These are two, two different kinds here. The one in the back is actually cement. It's very, very heavy, so you can't move it. The one here in the front is a trough that's made of um, called hypertufa, and I'll explain to that later what that is. But the mold that was used to create this hypertufa trough was a uh, styrofoam like, fishing bag, uh, fishing box or something like that. But this is one that was on display there when I was there a few years ago. <coughs> And this is a collection of troughs at the uh, University of British Columbia Botanic Garden in Vancouver. And this is a collection of troughs that Ed Glover has in Wisconsin. And he has various kinds, many of them are hypertufa, which I'll explain later. And he has uh, even two whiskey barrels that he has put sand in and gravel and created a rock garden plant. And one of the troughs in here, and I'm not sure which one it is, I think it's this one right here, is one that he got in 2004 when we had the NARD annual meeting here. <coughs> we gave away troughs at the annual meeting. I think uh, some various people made them. And he won the door prize or the table prize for that, uh, that trough and took it back. And I, when I visited him a, a few years later to speak to his uh, rock garden club, uh, he took me there. And that's the trough right there I mean, he got from here. But, so you see, there can be all kinds of shapes and sizes of troughs. And they don't have to be fancy as evidenced by these whiskey barrels. Now, this is one, a collection of troughs at the U.S. Botanic Garden, again, across the street from the Capitol Building right there. This is a, uh, was a display that the Botanic Garden had of various arboretum gardens around the United States were invited to come and have a display. And the, the uh, Denver Botanic Gardens sent troughs these hypertufa troughs and planted them. They were on display there for uh, over the summer of, for about two months. They're no longer there now, I don't think. But that's what they looked like when they were being displayed. So what are hypertufa troughs? I'll tell you what they are, and then I'll show you some pictures of them in a second of how of them being made. First of all, it's a, it's a one part mixture of Portland cement, uh, one part perlite, two parts milled uh, uh, peat moss, some fiberglass fibers and sand or vermiculite. One, one, two, and then these other parts. And this is a photograph of members of our rock garden group a few years ago making hypertrophic troughs at Amelia Lane and um, Beth Amenis uh, teaching it a few years ago. And what you're looking at here are uh, some hypertrophic mixture of that mixture I showed you that's been put over a uh, plastic dishpan or plastic tub or something of that kind. Maybe an inch and a half or two inches thick at most. And you let them dry. That's what the process looks like as it's being done. It's messy. They're wearing gloves. There's another photograph there. That's Amelia up there in the, in the middle of the, of the slide here, teaching the class. So she's working up in a, in a pan there and then they're putting it over this mold. Plastic container. And else is back here in the back too. And there's one that shows the mold underneath. 
this is a styrofoam bucket. And another example. Hmm. See, these are being, these are rounded ones, and there's a uh, sort of square. And these are some, in my garden, uh, taken a few years ago, a mixture of hypertube chocolate. Did you make them and, yourself? Uh, I made a, oh, a few of them. Most of them, uh, some I bought, some I made in classes of Amelia, Amelia taught as well. These are troughs upstairs on the roof of the garden here, of the uh, of room here. Uh, this was a collection uh, that Amelia Lane and uh, Beth Jimenez and others made uh, that were part of the North American Rock Garden Society uh, Norman Same Endowment Fund. The Arboretum applied for a grant, we got a grant. And these, uh, we were successful, and these are the shops that are, were built and put on display upstairs. And there's the sign. <clears throat> now, this is a, a trough, but it's not hypertufa, and it's not cement. Does anyone <coughs> know what kind of trough it is? <coughs> it's an animal watering trough from the 13 or 1400s where they were actually can you, made of stone. I've seen these for sale in uh, gardening magazines in the UK for like three or four thousand pounds, meaning five thousand, six thousand dollars each. But this is one that the Czech today. Rock Garden Club in Prague. Isn't that beautiful? Tim, I think you need to do a, a cactus trough collection <laughs> of the garden here. In your spare time. Now I want to give you some examples of um, rock garden plants that I would recommend you start with if you're a neophyte or uh, beginning to rock, do rock gardening here in the southeast or if you moved here for the first time, moved here and don't know the area very well. First rule of thumb is I would start with native plants. Something that you know is likely to survive, something you're likely to succeed with, start with a native plant. And a good to start with, will soon be blooming here in this area, is the dwarf crested iris, iris cristata. Another plant is green and gold. And green and gold is one of the plants, by the way, that Bill Hunt, when I mentioned the blocks of ice and sphagnum moss he did in 1935 in Chapel Hill, one of the plants that he used was green and gold, which is native around Chapel Hill. This is a form called Allen Bush. Uh, this is the eastern shooting star. It's not easy to find, and it's a little bit difficult to grow. Uh, Tom, this is a plant that we rescued from the plant rescue some years ago over near uh, Randerman Dam. Is Tom still here? No. No, there is Tom. I see him. There you are. That's one of the plants we collect. And by the way, it's the emblem of the North American Rock Garden Society, though the Cassian is. And this is a, um, a, a raised bed with flocks growing in it, another native plant. And uh, there are several species of ginger. Uh, a, a native plant that I would recommend you start with. This one requires shade. This one is not native to North Carolina, but it will grow here. And another plant, a native plant, is the early saxifrage, another one that we rescued from Randleman Dam over near High Point. Now, in terms of non-native plants, a plant I would recommend you start with is this plant called ice plant, uh, Delosperma. Uh, ice plants have had a resurgence over the past uh, decade or so, primarily because of Paniotic colitis at the Denver Botanic Garden. The gardens. He's made several trips to South Africa collecting in locations at higher elevation and cooler areas than had been done in the past. So as a result, there's a lot of new cultivars out there that will do very well here in North Carolina in full sun. And this is just one example there. Uh, this plant has an unfortunate cultivar name and is a little difficult to grow. Uh, it's not native, but it's called the winter iris, iris inguicularis. And that plant has been blooming for the past couple of weeks. I know here at the Arboretum you have some, uh, but this is a very pale form of the winter iris. But another plant to try if you can. Uh, this is a crocus. I don't believe it's firefly. It was, the label was that when I uh, bought the plant, but I don't think it's that particular cultivar. But anyway, this small bulbs, including crocus and small daffodils, 
another good example of a rock garden type plant that you can grow in either a raised bed or trough or burn. Another plant may be difficult to try, may not always succeed uh, for many years, is this primrose. This is called Primrose uh, Symphorpia. It's a cultivar that Cliff Parks, Cliff Parks is associated with Camellia Forest Nursery. It's a collection, it's a selection that he made uh, over the past several years, uh, which will grow well here in the heat of North Carolina. Uh, Symphorpia is a form that grows in the eastern Mediterranean. In Turkey in that area, which is why uh, he reasoned that it would grow well here in North Carolina because of the heat. And it does well. Uh, Pine Knot Farms, when they have their open house selling hellebores, they oftentimes sell some of his plants. And also you can buy them from a community forest nursery as well. <clears throat> and also a hardy cyclamen is a cyclamen coom or a cyclamen hegrifolium or a, a other good examples of rock garden plants I would recommend you try here <coughs> that are not native to this area. Columbines, there are native columbines, there are many, many kinds of columbines, short ones, tall ones, some that will certainly suit a rock garden situation. And the Linton Rose, or the Hellebore, the ones that are blooming now, uh, a good collection of them would, be, would do well in the rock garden. They wouldn't necessarily do well in a trough, but they would do well in a, a raised bed or a burn. And the Christmas rose, Hillebrus niger. And snowdrops, another bulb that I would recommend for a rock garden. Uh, perhaps not in a trough, but it's certainly in a raised bed or a, a burn. This is one called Bertram Anderson. And then, of course, uh, this is a an example of a snowdrop blooming at Montrose, Nancy Goodman's uh, garden in Hillsborough, North Carolina. This is a fall blooming snowdrop, uh, Galanthus elwesia, a variety of monosticus. There are also spring blooming for it, but the monosticus blooms in the fall, and for her it blooms in November. Now, some, a few outstanding rock garden plants, uh, rock gardens that I've seen. This is a portion of Ev Whitmore's garden in Brevard. And one other thing that you might want to do with this permatil or stalite, as, as it's called, the spired slate, is many gardeners simply will use that as a topping off to kind of make it look pretty on the top. In addition to use it to amend the soil and help improve drainage, you also put it on the top as well. And that's what you see here. <coughs> that, that's another photograph of Ed's garden. In, um, taken on the day we had the uh, annual meeting there two years ago with the rain pouring down. And this is uh, the garden, the Japanese rock garden of Joe and Beverly French, uh, also near Brevard, North Carolina. Another beautiful photograph? Oh, well, not photograph, but beautiful setting, I should say. Another photograph of the same area taken at a different time of the year. This is the garden in Scotland, and what's unique about this garden is uh, there was a, a vein of sand that runs through one part of that garden. And so the gardeners who lived there, uh, for various reasons, decided they would create a sunken rock garden because they had perfect drainage. The drainage they knew from the sand that was there, it was a watered runout, so they created a garden that's at a sort of at a flat level, not a raised rock garden, but a sunken one. And that's what it looks like. Only because they could do it because the sand was there which would drain the water away. And the same area, the same rock garden, a different part of the garden. Uh, it's an old rock garden. They, they've been gardening there for about 40 years, I think. Complete with a rainbow in the back. <clears throat> this is the Elizabeth Miller Garden in Seattle, Washington. wasn't kept up very well when I was there. A garden in South Carolina, Greenville, South Carolina, that it had just been installed, sort of a, a wall, raised bed uh, combination. And this is a garden in Scotland, um, a collection of troughs 
and other rock garden plantings uh, when I was there and looking out the bedroom window where I was staying as a guest. That's the site that I saw. And some of you may know Reb Lappy. She used to come to our meetings. She doesn't come anymore. But she has a, a nice rock garden, mostly native plants. She collected most of her stones from around Chapel Hill and the Hillsborough area. But that's a part of it there in the summertime, springtime with uh, hostas and other plants. This is a garden that had just been installed in Wisconsin, the Rotary Gardens. Uh, just been planted. You can imagine how it will look two or three years from the time the photograph is taken. And this is a very fine garden. This is a University of Wisconsin in Madison with a water stream running through the middle of it. This garden is maintained by the local chapter of the uh, Rock Garden Society there in, in, in Madison. And this is a, uh, the perfect combination of uh, a wife who likes rock garden plants and a husband who's a miniature train enthusiast. <laughs> so they put their two hobbies together and create a rock garden miniature train railroad set up there. <laughs> and then uh, John Massey's garden in the Midlands in, in the United Kingdom, uh, a little bit beyond the pale in terms of a uh, 12 inch rule of rock garden plants but it was uh, when he planted it some years ago the plants were in scale but that's his rock garden there which is mostly conifers and then this one is what i call the um, eastern north carolina redneck garden <laughs> i say that fondly uh, the garden is a mill and holiday uh, the garden itself is inside a quarry. Now, what you can't see is on three sides of this garden, up to about 30 or 40 feet, you have a, a rock wall. It was, it was quarried during the Soviet occupation era. And there's only one entrance, which is behind me, behind the camera there. Uh, it, was, it was put in by his father. His, the garden was put in by his father, who's now dead. But that's what he, he was gardening when I visited there a few years ago. The, uh, and it's about four times the size of what you see in this photograph here. A very, very fine rock garden, very beautiful rock garden, wonderful collection of plants. The other drawback besides the fact that it has all this junk debris and stuff in the yard is that it's on the runway, oh, the flight pattern for the Prague airport. <laughs> so every conversation you try to have is interrupted by a plane coming in, coming in for a landing or taking off. And then the the, tom, uh, the garden of the uh, Lake Laird, I'm sorry, the rock garden of the Lake Laird Thomas in New York City, who garden on the 11th floor of a balcony in New York City. The garden doesn't exist anymore because he died a couple years ago. And then a, a garden in Seattle, Washington. <coughs> I think from these continuous slides, you begin to see over and over the theme that people use. There's a lot of similarities there, something different from uh, at times, but generally the same theme is followed over and over again. <coughs> and this one is not a real garden, but it's the first place winner in the Philadelphia Flower Show in 2005. And what this represents is a uh, western Pennsylvania landscape with a farmhouse in the background here, it's painted in the background. All of these so-called rocks are actually styrofoam, painted. The only real rock is this one right here. But all the plants are real. And it won first place in the Philadelphia Flower Show in 2005, and there's a cup to prove right there. Tim, does that look familiar? No. No. <laughs> Don't tell the judges that. And the ultimate in rock writing is this. <laughs> Anyone know what that is? Coffin. It's an old coffin. Roman coffin that was unearthed uh, in Surrey, England, when they were putting in waterworks uh, in the, near the city there, uh, one of the cities there. And apparently they're so common that you can actually buy them. And this fellow, Graham Nichols, who lives, who wrote a book on rock gardening, uh, actually obtained one, so he's got it up back of his house there. He's planted with all these beautiful plants. So that is the opening rock garden. And then one last slide is this one. 
This is a slide called Get Fuzzy. It says, in my defense, your fringe rock card looked like a litter box. <laughs> and that's it. Any questions? <coughs> yes, Marilyn? Does anybody use anything like a fan to offset the excess moisture over a rock garden? A pan to collect it? A fan. A fan. Oh, Ev, yes. Ev Whitmore, the woman in, I showed you there from the bar, mm -hmm. when I visited her uh, the first time in her first garden, she had a fan. She was growing um, um, Himalayan poppy. Uh, you know, a beautiful plant that nobody can grow. Uh, she was at 3,000 feet elevation, I think, at the time the garden was. But she was she had electric fans growing, blowing over a collection of Himalayan poppy. And she's not the only one I've seen do that. But yes, Richard. Yeah, when I had questions. Pleasant Garden in Greensboro. I built a to build a rock garden, but I didn't make the soil in it uniform. I built a raised bed mm -hmm. around the periphery. I put in a French drain. Mm -hmm. Halfway the drain. across the French drain, I started the wall. Mm -hmm. And the, the initial soil was sandy loam in a sort of berm shape. And then I started backfilling towards towards the direction of the wall with increasingly more porous material. That, uh, straight builder sand, mm -hmm. and then fine, and then a layer of uh, coarse peat moss to keep the act as a filter, and then some fine crushed rock. So I had a gradient going towards the wall of increasingly, and I used that as a way to experiment with plants that were successively. In other words, I put a plant and I let see if it would worn towards the wall or towards the towards back to the center to, to help help it determine what it wanted where it wanted to go. I was wondering if anyone's ever experimented in experiments like that here. I, I don't know of anyone, but it, it's, it seems like you it solves the same problem by creating the drainage that you need for that. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, I was Carol? puzzled by your um, hypertuff. I've tried doing it once and it was a disaster. It totally fell apart. Um, but I thought as the um, cement sets up, doesn't it sort of contract? So I was it, it, wondering how that works. You've had them over the plastic support. It's over a support like a plastic Yeah, but as it bag, dries, it, does, it okay. wants to draw in, doesn't it? I don't so think, it, I don't think it's, it decreases that much in, in the... Uh, well, you need to keep it moist. If you do it out in the sun or a hot spot, it'll dry too fast. It'll just crumble up and become like dust. If you want to do it in the shade or I mean, maybe does it indoors, or if you do it outside, cover it's, it. It's like usually it. covered it over, right? Yeah, you yes. cover it, and you might you might even need to wet it down a couple of times as it as it dries. Well, where do you get the fiberglass fibers? Because that maybe might have been the problem. I don't know where she got it. Green. Uh, uh, Chris, are there any plans for a, a workshop? Thank you for asking. We do have a hypertufa <laughs> workshop in July. Carolyn, there's your answer. And we are also doing a cast concrete leaf in the form of bird baths at this on the same day but later in the day. Jim? I was going to say, at one time, I recently, you, you could just get one of the big box, I'll be able to load you. you can buy bags start. of fiberglass yes. to strengthen concrete. Oh, really? You have to be careful using it, though. Yeah, because of the yeah, fingers on Richard? I think the thing about the uh, but we're keeping the hypertufa damp for a while is that concrete takes a while to set. And the reason what it's doing while it's setting is that the limestone is reacting with the silicate to actually form a chemical reaction, turning into a calcium silicate or a permanent structure. And if you can't rush that process, you have to have the right temperature of humidity for the, the given your conditions. And there's a window of too much moisture and too long and too cold and too warm. You have to balance it. That's why they, for instance, they don't pour concrete in the wintertime. Because they have and, and roads and construction because you can't get the things to set properly. So it's a matter of balancing those factors out. That may have may help solve that problem of forming a stable uh, hydrogen wall. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much for coming.